I've been doing some research and reading up on early American historical events. And since we were traveling northward, we would be passing nearby some important historical places. So I took the opportunity to visit some of those places along my way. A lot of American history got its start in the state of Massachusetts. GPS is helpful, but I like to travel with a map. GPS will get you from point A to point B, but you could miss out on some very relevant and interesting sites without a physical map. I collect maps as I travel around the country. You can usually pick up one for free when you visit the state's visitor center during normal business hours. You will find them if you are traveling interstate highways and usually shortly after you cross a state line. I chose all the places on the map that I wanted to see and plotted my path. It is nice to make stops when you're traveling a long distance. It helps to break up the monotony of the long haul, and it makes traveling far more meaningful and pleasurable. One problem we found, though, while traveling through the state of Massachusetts was that they have changed many of their exit numbers, so it didn't match up with the map I had. That is where a GPS is far better if your system is updated, which ours was not. <laughs> First place I wanted to see was Plymouth Rock in Plymouth, Massachusetts, the very place where the pilgrims first landed. They traveled on the Mayflower when they took their sea voyage from Europe to the New World. There was a rocky little bay where they must have docked their ship. The famous rock is currently sheltered by a colonnade and is open to the public. This is a popular site for tourists because nearly everyone in America knows about Plymouth Rock and the Pilgrims. The Pilgrims were fleeing religious persecution with a dream of having religious freedom, which they would find in America. This is the location where our country began. Nearby is a replica vessel of the Mayflower that you can step on board for a price. We opted to just take photos of it because we had many other places we wanted to see that day. After stopping at a gift shop to pick up a few trinkets, we went to our next location. Not far from Plymouth Rock in the same town is the National Monument to the Forefathers, which is free to the public, open from dawn to dusk, from April through November. This impressive statue, made from Maine granite, stands 81 feet tall from the ground to the top of her head. The weight of the monument is 180 tons. The first cornerstone was laid August 1st, 1859. It was completed 1889, built to honor the passengers of the Mayflower. It was built by a Boston sculptor named Hammett Billings. It has allegorical figures depicting the virtues of faith, morality, education, law, and liberty. Towering high in its majestic splendor, the central figure of the monument is faith. She stands upon a main pedestal, one foot resting upon a replica of Plymouth Rock. She holds an open Bible in her left hand. Her right hand points heavenward. The symbolism is trust God and His words written for us in the Bible. Below her are four seated figures representing the Christian values and principles promulgated by the pilgrims themselves. They are morality, law, education, and liberty. Law is tempered with justice on the one hand and mercy on the other. Education is represented with the wisdom of maturity on the one side and youth following experience on the other. Liberty is accompanied by peace on the one side and overthrow of tyranny on the opposite side. The main pedestal has four polished facades. Two of these bear the names of the Mayflower pilgrims or travelers. 
while another bears the inscription, National Monument to the Forefathers, erected by a grateful people in remembrance of their labors, sacrifices, and sufferings for the cause of civil and religious liberty. Heading north, we went into Boston, home of the first subway train in America that was built in 1897. Boston had a problem with congestion in its narrow colonial streets, with overcrowding issues, especially during frequent winter blizzards. Also, the influx of immigrants from Ireland, Italy, Germany, and Eastern Europe added to the congestion because Boston was a first stop for many of the migrants. The invention of the electric motor, born out of the second phase of the Industrial Revolution, made way for a cleaner train, unlike the London trains that filled the air with ash and soot. The underground subway system brought a needed solution for Boston. While in Boston, we searched to locate the gravesite of Mother Goose, which is reported to have been buried here. But these grave markers are so old, most of the engravings are worn off. I know the woman who was called Mother Goose buried here is not the original Mother Goose, but I'll save that story for another time. Yes, we are wandering around a cemetery. <laughs> Some of the dates are from the 1700s. Some of the stones are broken or fallen down. It was nearly impossible to identify who's who buried here. I desire to visit the Old North Church, where Paul Revere would have began his midnight ride to warn that the British were coming. That is where one if by land and two lanterns if by sea were hung in the church tower. Because at the time, it was the tallest structure in Boston. Revere's ride would take him to Lexington to warn Jonas Clark, who was housing John Hancock and Samuel Adams at the time. The British wanted to capture and kill these two men and had heard that they were in the company of the preacher, who was also a community political leader. The drive to Lexington by car from Boston is about 19 minutes, but it would likely have been about an hour's ride on horseback. I had to visit Lexington and walk on the green in the center of town where Jonas Clark's church once stood. I took off my shoes, my bare feet, walking on the grass of the Lexington green, connecting with history. As I contemplated, the first battle of the Revolutionary War that took place right here. This is where the shot that was heard around the world happened. I look towards Boston to imagine the British soldiers marching up the road toward the church as the armed parishioners stood their ground with their preacher and prepared for battle. They yelled, In the name of the King of England, throw down your arms! Parker responded back, We recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. Then he turned to his team of Minutemen, Stand your ground, men. Don't fire unless fired upon. All members of Jonas Clark's church, both white men and black, telling them, But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. It was a merciless bloodbath, without provocation, with no declaration of war. 800 British soldiers opened fire upon roughly 60 to 70 colonists. Eight men died and 10 were wounded on the church property. This is a Lexington Green. It's a triangular space in the town of Lexington, where the first battle of the Revolutionary War was fought. This monument was built in 1799 to honor the men who died in that battle. The inscription reads, Sacred to liberty and the rights of mankind and the freedom and independence of America, sealed and defended with the blood of her sons, this monument is erected by the inhabitants of Lexington under the patronage and the expense of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to the memory of their fellow citizens and signed Robert Monroe. Then it goes on to list the names of the men who fell on this field, the first victims of the sword of British tyranny and oppression on the morning of the ever memorialized 19th of April 1775. The die was cast 
The blood of these martyrs is the cause of God and their country, was the cement of the union of these states, then colonies, and gave the spring to the spirit, firmness, and resolution of their fellow citizens. They rose as one man to avenge their brethren, blood at the point of a sword, to avert and defend their native right. They nobly dared to be free. The contest was long, bloody, affecting righteous heaven, proved solemn appeal, victory crowned with arms and the peace, liberty, and independence of the United States of America was their glorious reward. The church no longer stands here. It was years later destroyed by fire, but there is a marker where it once stood, and also a marker where the belfry was, where Jonas Clark rang the bell to alert the town. Later, a burial memorial was erected to remember those brave men who put their lives on the line, standing up against British tyranny. We also observed a nearby tavern near the Lexington Green. Jonas Clark would often meet with the townsfolks in taverns to discuss political matters. Back in the day, preachers were as actively involved in politics as they were preaching the gospel. I feel too many preachers have strayed away from political matters for far too long, which has led to the demise of our country today. In my studies, I have learned that it was the preachers many preachers, like more than 30 of them, throughout the colonies who inspired the Revolutionary War. Were it not for the old-time preachers, we would not have grown up in the country we have all known as America. This is where America was born. Just up the road, a small piece, we found the home of Jonas Clark. Sometimes he would have political meetings in his home. On the night of April 19, 1775, he had two guests staying with him that were considered rabble-rousers because they were stirring up the colonists against British rule. An order was sent out to bring back the bodies of John Hancock and Samuel Adams. But the two men escaped that night as the brave American colonists stood in the gap. Those British soldiers, after they slaughtered those men, they marched on to Concord next because that's where the armory was. They wanted to confiscate the arm to disarm the colonists. But you know what happened? On their march back to Boston, the, their path was lined with a bunch of Minutemen who were alerted by Paul Revere as well as other riders that night. And so on the way back, the British lost a lot of men because the colonists fought back. Here we are, standing at the original home of the preacher, Jonas Clark, who led his community in religious and political matters. Here is a look at the community where his home sits. His home is on Hancock Street, not far from the Lexington Green. One observation I made outside Jonas Clark's home was that he had an herb garden planted right there on his front lawn. The practice of a grassy green front lawn became a fashionable thing, but it wasn't always that way. People used to grow their own vegetables and herbs. It was only gradually over time, as markets and grocery stores were developed, that people who had the financial means could go to market to buy what they needed. So the grassy green front lawns became a symbol of prosperity, showing that they could afford to buy what they needed instead of growing it themselves. I think we should go back to growing our own food because we certainly can't trust the FDA or any government agency to look out for our true best interest. Heading further north of Boston, we stopped into Salem, Massachusetts. I'm sure you've heard of it. The place where the famous Salem witch trials took place? That's not why I came here. I was more interested in searching out the roots of a preacher named Roger Williams, whom I have studied. Williams was the first Baptist preacher in America. He started the first Baptist church in America. He was also the first individualist and he was the first preacher to be banned because of his preaching. By many he was considered a radical with radical ideas. Roger Williams grew up in London in a time of religious conflict and persecution, but at the tender age of 12 he aligned with the Puritans and Separatists of London, departing from the Church of England, which displeased his father. He held memories of old England 
and of Captain John Smith and the Pocahontas Maiden. Roger Williams became the personal chaplain of the pilgrims who sailed to the New World on the Mayflower. He later accepted a call to Salem, Massachusetts to minister there. Williams became impassioned with the possibilities of freedom and separation from the chains of the standing order, away from the pressure of England's black hats. He was being carefully observed by the black hats. The fight for religious liberty began in earnest after 14 persons were rounded up and sent to prison in Bristol for refusing to pay the minister in Freetown, Massachusetts, the general court required every town to support an orthodox minister and punishment was prescribed for any that would refuse and the tyranny that followed created a blight on the history of new england the legislature compelled every town to set up and maintain a church state and to hire and provide for a minister holding an academic degree all funded by the taxes of citizens regardless of religious affiliation those who refused to pay the tax were subject to punishment by the state through its agent the local state congregations including the seizure of personal property and imprisonment as williams earnestly labored to promote the establishment of full liberty of conscience in his country. The powers that be bent all their power against him. For five short years, his enemies exercised his banishment. His ideas of freedom of worship was considered dangerous, and it would upset the social order of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. In other words, the leadership wanted to maintain their control over the people, and anyone who had dissenting beliefs was considered troublesome. Does that sound familiar with what we're seeing today? Having been both a witness to and a victim of religious persecutions, Roger Williams believed that most of the wars in the world were the result of religious conflict. Unlike most Massachusetts ministers, Williams did not believe that the Bible demanded punishment of religious heretics. His interpretation of scripture made him a serious threat to the authority of a colonial society that depended on the Bible as a life guide. Our historians have failed to remind us that the church, state, and marriage in Massachusetts remained in place for over 160 years, past the time of the Revolution. European influence of a dominating culture brought devastation. Homes were stolen, property taken, and banishments were affected. There were beatings and imprisonment whippings and hangings, a spectacle in crimson red. Although his Salem congregation embraced his teachings, the ministers and magistrates in the colonial capital did not. Williams' ideas grew even more radical. Roger Williams believed the civil magistrates had no right to restrain the consciousness of man or to interfere with their modes of worship or religious belief. The court at Boston called for the removal of Roger Williams for his stand against these unjust laws. They offered the people a choice, lose the beach at Marblehead or lose the preacher. They chose to keep the beach and get rid of the preacher. This is the same Salem, Massachusetts, where 57 years later, the infamous witch trials took place, and the violation of Psalms 105.15. The courts moved swiftly to remove him with talk of execution. He was to be banished on September 1636, but he did not show up for his banishment. He fled to find refuge with the savages, the Narragansett Indians. Hmm. I think the savages were really the ones he left behind. I'm going to have to do a separate video just on the fascinating story of Roger Williams because his story is so relevant to what we are seeing happening today. And if we do not learn lessons from history, we will surely repeat the same mistakes of the past. So, 57 years after Roger Williams was banished, 
During one cold spring of 1692, the quiet Puritan settlement of Salem, Massachusetts, descended into madness. If you mix superstition with a mob mentality, you get the perfect potion for the Salem witch trials. It began with a small group of girls behaving strangely. A doctor blamed the behavior on bewitching. Then the girls blamed a slave named Tuba. Rather than professing her innocence, Tituba confessed and alleged that there were other witches in their midst. Some of the outspoken people who objected to the witch trials found themselves on the receiving end of witchcraft accusations. Hundreds were accused, and the trials began. We visited the cemetery where the victims were buried. They lay down a cement pathway, allowing tourists to visit the gravesite. At the entrance of the cemetery were the pleas of confess, the accused. I should save my life. Don't help me. Holy innocent of such God wickedness. knows I am innocent. I do plead. I not deny guilty it. to my dying. There are three large oak trees within the cemetery. I couldn't help but think of how the roots of these massive trees is possibly entangled in the bones of those buried here. We would be wise to consider the roots of the dark event that took place in this small New England town. In the end, 20 people were executed, 19 were hung, and the other was a man in his 80s who was pressed to death under heavy stones for refusing to submit to a trial on witchcraft charges. Four others died awaiting trial. Dozens of others suffered behind bars without standing trial. The Salem witch trials testify to the importance of due process in protecting individuals against false accusations. My final desired visit in Massachusetts was to locate their beautiful beach that the people of Salem opted to keep over the preacher. Was it worth it? And anyhow, how could they remove a beach? I guess people will always buckle under fear. We have certainly seen that these last couple of years too, haven't we? We found the Marblehead area that's on the opposite side of the bay from Salem. The coastline of Massachusetts has many bays and inlets. We explored both sides of the rocky coastline, enjoying the peaceful serenity of the seascape with the boats coming and going. I love the sights, sounds, and smells of coastal New England. My what a beautiful place. This doesn't look like a beach at all. We continued our search for a beach, and on the way out, we found it, and it was beautiful. I must say, the Massachusetts coastline is very beautiful. The New England homes were also a marvel to view. I am also in love with the New England architecture. These old homes have a beauty that draws me in. The fact that many of them are still standing after over a hundred years testifies to the quality of their structure. Today's modern built homes can't hold a candle to them. The older homes have far more character to them than your average home. I will always love New England for its beauty and older styled homes. Would to God that we as a people could stand as strong and as enduring as these old homes. Our country is young, only 245 years old at this publishing, yet we appear to be falling apart at the seams. The freedom that Roger Williams, Jonas Clark, and his men fought for is almost lost unless we as a people rise up and make our voices heard, holding our elected leaders accountable to us. Are we willing to make a stand, to sacrifice for the good of all? It's up to us to fight to protect our liberties. We must not allow the authorities over us to reign tyranny upon us. Remember your history.